Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Deborah Lampert Rudman, and I'm the Curator of Education and Public Programs at Morvan Museum and Garden. I'm uh, with you tonight by the power of Zoom in one of our galleries, and I have Anna Spudnot Stockton over my right shoulder and a couple of different images. Um, but more importantly, um, I want to just welcome you here tonight and also to invite you, if you have any questions for our panelists this evening, to post them into the Q&A. And to get our evening started, I want to introduce to you one of our Morvan's favorite docents, Kim Gallagher, and he will be right here for all of you. Welcome, Kim. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, delighted to be co-hosting this with Debbie uh, for uh, two big reasons. One, because uh, Morvan is such a wonderful place. Uh, they put on uh, events like this and have wonderful speakers. And the speaker tonight we've scored is one of my favorites, Woody Holton from the University of South Carolina. Uh, his latest book is called Liberty is Sweet, which I'll talk a little bit more about in 15 seconds. But uh, first, uh, let me uh, mention a couple of things. Remember, Morbin in May is, uh, is impending. Uh, it's already possible to order uh, plants and you'll be able to do that through April 10th. They can be picked up in mid-May. Um, July 4th celebration is coming up. And even closer than that is another event like this, another uh, a speaker uh, discussion about history. Uh, the Civics Book Club is meeting this Thursday, March 24th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, discussing the American Experiment by David M. Rubenstein, and the discussion will be led by John Baxter. Now, this is my favorite book about the American Revolution, written by our speaker tonight. This book is not for the faint of heart or for the person who is really tightly wedded to the traditional story of the American Revolution. But don't just take my word for it. Take Annette Gordon Reed's word for it. And this is also a pretty good book if, if you're looking for one to read on Juneteenth. She uh, declared, if I can find my notes, that this is a, this, Liberty is Sweet, is a deeply researched and bracing retelling of the American Revolution, showing how the founders were influenced by overlooked Americans, women, who he'll be talking about tonight, Native Americans, Afri African Americans, and religious dissenters. Like I said, this is not for the faint of heart. Uh, <laughs> Woody is known for being provocative. Uh, and uh, he also has a way of working in uh, discussions of how history uh, interpretations have changed over the years and how his interpretations compare with the more traditional stories. Uh, I think you'll really enjoy uh, the talk tonight by Woody. Uh, and if you've got questions, he loves questions. You know, the more provocative, the better. I, I hope I'm <laughs> not putting you on the spot too much, Woody. I don't okay. know. With that, I turn it back over to Debbie. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, and Kim's right. Uh, this is going to be, uh, you know, Woody Holton um, has told me that history is not just about dates. It's about debates. So we're hoping for some debates tonight. Uh, Woody Holton is McCausland Professor of History at the University of South Carolina, where he teaches and researches early American history, especially the American Revolution, with a focus on economic history and on African Americans, Native Americans, and women. Um, as Kim mentioned, he is the author of several books, um, one of them including Abigail Adams, which he wrote on a Guggenheim Fellowship and which was awarded the Bancroft Prize. Um, his second book, Unruly Americans and the Origins of the Constitution, was a finalist for the National Book Award. Um, and as Kim <laughs> proudly showed, uh, Woody's most recent book, Liberty is Sweet, has um, gotten rave reviews, including the one that he mentioned by Pulitzer Prize winning historian Annette Gordon Reed. Um, it has more than a thousand eyewitness records. And um, Dr. Holton shows how the founders were influenced by those overlooked Americans, women, Native Americans, African Americans, and religious dissenters. So we're going to hear about many of them this evening. And please post any questions you have in the QA. And without further ado, I'm honored and delighted to present to you Woody Holton. Thank you very much, Debbie. I'll 
take just a second to share my screen, that part of it. And there's our heroine to start things off. Um, and, and I thought I would start off by talking about women's role in the American Revolution before it became a revolutionary war. Although you'll also see uh, that women played a big role in the war as well. So that'll be the second thing I talk about. Um, and then um, finally, start to talk, and I think Debbie, maybe you'll join me for the third part of this to talk about the impact of the revolution on women. And that's where we'll really focus on uh, uh, Annis Boudinot Stockton and on Abigail Adams, who, uh, as Debbie mentioned, I'm especially interested in. Um, and um, we'll, we'll see, I, I, I'm kind of of two minds about the, about the impact, um, or maybe three minds, because maybe it was positive, maybe it was negative, and, and uh, maybe it was mixed. Uh, but to begin at the beginning, um, everybody, I hope, will remember that the American Revolution really started around 1764 or five, but it didn't become a war for another decade until 1775. And so during that earlier period, there was plenty of violence, for instance, the tarring and feathering of stamp collectors and customs agents and so forth, but it, was, but it wasn't a war. And during that period, there were lots of other strategies for influencing the British. And it turns out that women played a really crucial role uh, in those protests. For instance, something that we are doing right now, most of the world is doing right now, is trying to economically isolate the Russians. Well, the colonists tried to do that to Britain after the Stamp Act and later after the tea tax um, and even more so in 1774. So there were these three boycotts of British merchandise. About a third of Britain's trade was with its own colony. So you can imagine if you can do an effective boycott, you can really get the attention of parliament. But there was a catch to that, which is men are doing all of this political organizing and they're in the legislatures and all that. Um, but women are doing half of the consuming. So the boycotts don't work unless you can get women to participate. Uh, and women did actively participate. For instance, uh, we all know about the tax on tea that will lead in 1773 to the Boston Tea Party. Um, we, you have women early on signing their own boycotts. So, so you almost never see women's names in the newspaper. Maybe if they're, if they're wealthy and famous, when they get married and when they die, uh, but, but in the revolution, you are starting to see women's names, hundreds of women's names because they're signing their names to petition to boycott tea. Um, now, what I've just told you shows up in a lot of histories of women in the revolution, but my contribution that I'm trying to make in Liberty is Sweet is to integrate women's history with men's history and black history with white history and so forth. And I, and I can give, I think, a good illustration of that here because many books about women's role in the revolution mention uh, a, a boycott of tea that women did um, in the first week of, of February, 1770, saying we are gonna totally boycott tea, sickness accepted. And the sickness accepted I wanna underscore because Women were the doctors. We still talk about doctor mom today, but when there were very few uh, doctors with MDs or even men who claimed to have MDs um, and people lived far apart and all that, most of your medical care came from mom. And one medicine that mom used, I think I still use this when I get a cold, was tea. So they did make that exception for tea. But here's what happens when you put the women's history in the same timeline as the traditional male history, because of course that's how things happened. Well, what you find is that just a week earlier, that was I think just uh, February 5th, 1770, a week before that, the men of Boston had taken upon themselves as the heads of the household, as the way men saw themselves on that day, they'd taken it upon themselves to, say, to do, uh, do their own boycott and they had committed their families but here's the key point. The men had said, we're gonna boycott tea, tea with no exceptions whatsoever. So when you put the men's boycott 
where it was a week before the women's boycott and the women's boycott says, we are gonna make an exception for tea. You see, there's actually a little bit of a battle going on there between men who don't wanna make that medical exception uh, and women who do. So one of the things I'm most interested in that I write about a lot in my book is all of the internal conflicts. And it's really clear, a lot of Native Americans are battling against the colonists, African-Americans, about half those is those in the, who participated in the revolution in the North fought on the American side, but about half of African-Americans who participated, that is in the South, fought on the British side. So in a sense, the Revolutionary War was an African-American civil war. It was actually a Native American civil war too, the Iroquois split uh, with most going with the British and some going with the Americans. And, but, but even among whites, there are internal conflicts you, I'll know about loyalists. New Jersey, where you, many of you are, had lots of loyalists. And South Carolina, I'm in the back country, part of South Carolina, we had lots of loyalists. But I'm especially interested in these uh, little conflicts between, uh, between men and women. Um, now, in addition to being crucial to just by uh, giving up tea, women also played a role, at least symbolically, in replacing the thread that Americans had imported from Britain. You know, the spinning wheel is one of those symbols of colonial America, but the reality is in places like New Jersey and the coastal towns, New York, Philly, Boston, Charleston, South Carolina, if you lived anywhere near navigable water, it was actually Actually, cheaper for you to, than it was to manufacture uh, the cloth here in America. So people had women had spinning wheels, but they were kind of for the very poor. They were for spinsters, to, to use a modern kind of slur. That is, women who spun because they'd never gotten married, so they live with their sister and try to help with their upkeep by doing a little spinning. And spinning wheels were out on the frontier, so. Spinning wheels, to use got a slur of my own, they're kind of a redneck thing. That's, oh yeah, most, a proper woman like Annis um, uh, Boudinot Stockton would not be caught spinning because it was a low class thing to do. But starting in 1769, uh, on a major scale, a little bit before that uh, in a few places, but on a big scale in 69, the colonists started boycotting British cloth again, to try to get Parliament's attention and get them to repeal the Townsend duties on tea and other products. So to get we, we want to bar, boycott Parliament, and the biggest thing the colonists imported from Britain was cloth. So that means well we are go naked as soon as our clothes wear out, or we replace that cloth that we used to import. And so here's where men once again relied on women for the revolution to work. Uh, women had played a crucial role in the tea boycott and they drastically reduced their importation of tea. Now they want to drastically reduce how much uh, cloth they're buying. That means women spinning. And so, especially New England, but as far south as New Jersey and Pennsylvania, women held spinning bees, or they more commonly called them spinning matches, you know, the way we would say a, a tennis match today, because these women would bring their spinning wheels, they're not that heavy. You can carry a, a couple miles down the road to your neighbor's house and they would gather often at the preacher's house. You'd have 15 or more women all spinning all day and competing to see who much who can spin the, the most thread um, in one day. And this didn't materially increase the amount of thread on these particular occasions, but it did something even more important than that. And that is it normalized spinning. That is, it made spinning not something just for the lower classes, but something that was a patriotic uh, experience that middle and upper class women could participate in. And so the idea was that they would then go home and not be ashamed of spinning uh, at home. Um, but it's interesting, this, this prejudice against spinning in the South, that took a racial form. That is, people rightly associated spinning with enslaved African-American women. For instance, George Washington had lots of women who that was their job uh, of the women that he 
by the laws of the time owned, uh, he had them spinning uh, all, all the time. Um, my point is that for white women, the association between spinning and slavery was so great that they just could not bring themselves to engage in spinning, even for the patriotic purpose of the revolution. And so we have no evidence of any of these spinning bees uh, anywhere in the South. Well, I promised some more conflict uh, between men and women. And here's where I can talk about Annis Boudinot Stockton because while she later ended up publishing a bunch of her poems and she became well known uh, as a poet, the great majority of women poets of the revolutionary era, and there was a surprisingly large number of them, the great majority of them did not publish in the official sense, like putting something in the Pennsylvania Chronicle, as you see here, but they did publish them sort of in the 18th century equivalent of us having blogs. You know, if I, I can't report to my boss that I published an article, if all I did was publish it uh, online somewhere, but it may get more, more clicks more, more eyeballs than if I'd published it in the Journal of American History. Well, what women's version of the internet was, they had their own informal internet of passing handwritten poems around uh, among themselves. Um, and, and these things really did get a lot of currency. I can't resist telling you guys an Abigail Adams story. She, um, she had a cousin that she sent all these letters to critiquing European literature, including French plays and poems and all of that. And, and when I was first reading those letters, I go, oh, this cousin must live far away because they'd write these long letters to each other. And then when I got up to Massachusetts where she lived, I figured out the cousin lived just down the street, but they were writing letters to each other uh, as, as young women to educate each other, to practice their writing, to practice their critiquing critical thinking skills, because of course women were denied formal education beyond a very elementary level. So if they wanted to be educated, they had to take it upon themselves to, to educate themselves. So it wouldn't be correct to say that they were self-educated like Benjamin Franklin, although they were that too, but that wouldn't be enough. What they really were, were socially educated. They educated each other. And then for some that became writing poems. The reason I'm putting up this issue of the Pennsylvania Chronicle is that one of those female poets who circulated things in manuscript wrote a, a poem that she called uh, The Female Patriots, and I'll zoom in uh, on it there. Um, and her name uh, was Hannah Griffiths. And she was in the same circle. Uh, you all know how close, even if you're not in New Jersey yourself, you know how close uh, uh, central New Jersey is to Philadelphia, people are going back and forth and sharing these poems back and forth. So Hannah Griffith wrote this poem, as you see in 1768, um, and this is another example of, of a poem that's been looked at in isolation as a contribution to women's history, which it definitely is, but it's also to, interesting to put it in context of what men were up to at the time. So she wrote it in 1768. She didn't write it for publication, but somebody uh, got it into the newspaper so that we can read it now. And if you'll see the part that I've put in blue there, if the sun's so degenerate, the blessings despise, let the daughters of liberty nobly arise. And people rightly pick up on the phrase daughters of liberty. One of my favorite historians, Mary Beth Norton at Cornell wrote a book called Liberty's Daughters, I think taking off from this phrase. Um, and, and that's cool, but let's not neglect the first line of that because here's the context in which she wrote this in 1768. She was a Quaker, living in Philadelphia, and the Quaker merchants of Philadelphia had refused to go along with the boycott of British merchandise. It had started in Boston. The New Yorkers had signed on. The New York merchants uh, had signed on to this boycott, but they said, we're only going to do this if Philadelphia merchants will also join in it. And when the boycott got down to Philadelphia, those merchant male merchants refused to participate. Quakers, as many of you know, are pacifists, and uh, some of them saw that as not, we can't do anything at all political. Some of them, frankly, were pretty pro-British, and so they didn't want to boycott for that reason. But for whatever reason, the Philadelphia merchants would not participate in the boycott. That caused the New York merchants to drop out of it. So the boycott's really starting to fall apart. And so 
you can see what, what um, Hannah Griffith is doing here. She's both a woman prodding the men and she's a patriot prodding these merchants who are ruining the boycott by not participating. So you see both a loyalist versus patriot kind of conflict and a, a overlaid over top of that is, uh, is a woman uh, feeling the need to prod uh, the men along. So pretty cool. Well, before we get to the Revolutionary War, I want to mention one other group of women who played a role in the run up to uh, run up to the into the to the revolution, but it's not exactly the role you'd expect. Um, I'm going to I'm looking I'm showing a British map of that era, and that line that I just put in blue is basically it is the crust of the Appalachian the crest of the Appalachian Mountains, and that blue line was put in there uh, in 1763 by the British government. I made it fatter for you to see. And it said to the colonists, you may not go west of this line um, because the British government didn't want to provoke another war against the Indians. Most expensive thing a government does is go to war. And, and the British government had just paid for a big war ending in 1763, so they drew that line stay on your side of this line, colonists, and we don't want to get into another war with the Indians. But the colonists did want to go west. Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, great many of the patriots were land speculators. They wanted to get huge chunks of that western land, divide it up, sell it off, and this blue line is stopping them. And so the colonists petitioned the British government, please, please let us have this western land. Get rid of that blue line. But at the same time that Parliament heard from the colonists wanting that land, they also heard from the people behind that blue star. That's the Wabash River. Now, right now, it's the Indiana, uh, Illinois border. And the people behind that blue star were the female peace chiefs uh, among those Native nations. So those are Native nations that have four kinds of chiefs, you think of, you know, there's a chief of the tribe, but no, they had four kinds. They had war, uh, male uh, war chiefs and also male peace chiefs who ran the village during peacetime and handled matters of peace. And they had female war chiefs who helped decide whether to go to war or not. And finally, the fourth group, female peace chiefs. And it was this fourth group that in 1769 uh, sent wampum belts, those beaded belts, to other native nations all through this area that's now the Midwest saying, we've been battling each other. We need to get together. They even started recruiting some of the Southern nations who'd been their big enemies. We got to all get together to form this one giant coalition of Indians to fight the colonists and save our land. Here's my point. The British government found out what these female peace chiefs were up to and the British government was terrified of getting into another war with the Indians, not because there was any chance of them pushing the colonists into the ocean. There were two million colonists by then. That wasn't going to happen. But the government didn't want to pay for another war. And so when the government is confronted with, on the one hand, a petition from the colonists saying, let us go west of that blue line. And on the other hand, these women organizing, the British government decided to listen to those women instead of to the colonists, and it left that blue line, the proclamation line of 1763 in place. And that became one of the grievances that drove the colonists into rebellion. So if you read the Declaration of Independence, of course it mentions taxes, but only once. It mentions Native Americans and their land three times. And I don't mean to say that Native American men weren't part of this story too, they were, but this, the, the line that I've drawn really begins with those Native American uh, women peace chiefs out on the Wabash River. So um, one other uh, person I wanna mention, a, a woman from the pre-revolutionary era uh, is Phyllis Wheatley, who published um, uh, her poems in London in uh, 1773. Uh, if you haven't heard of her, you can tell from the drawing that she's African-American. And she's not only the first black woman, but the first African-American uh, male or female to publish a book of poetry. She was still a slave owned by a family uh, named the Whitley's in Boston when she published this in 1773. 
but shortly after she came back. And the best historians of this probably thinks, thinks it was probably a deal in which she agreed to come back in return. Uh, okay, because uh, she went over to London to, to help promote the book um, and met all sorts of, of, of top people over there, including Ben Franklin, who happened to be there. Um, but she came back and met the, um, uh, and, and came back and, and, and finally uh, was freed. And she had written um, some poems uh, praising British leaders, uh, but she then later becomes a, 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 a patriot uh, poet. For instance, wrote in 1775, a poem really praising George Washington. And I can't resist telling you that before George Washington got that poem, he kicked all of the African-Americans out of the Continental Army. You know, he's a Southern guy, he owns hundreds of slaves, he can't imagine serving with black people. And so he did the racist thing of kicking them out. After he got this poem praising him, and I should admit some other things happened too that we could talk about Q&A, but one of the things that changed his mind, at least about free blacks. That is, Washington, after receiving this poem from Phyllis Wheatley, praising him, he invited her to come see him sometime out in Cambridge where he was stationed. Um, he changed his mind and let free blacks back into the army. And she was part, not all, but part of that, of that decision, I think. Okay, so all of this, I'll go quicker on the rest of it. Oh, if we have time, we can talk uh, at the end about this amazing poem she wrote that seems, uh, stress seems to celebrate her enslavement because it brought her to Christianity and it raised the great issue. Um, I think it ends up being an anti-racist poem, but we can talk about it, uh, talk about it later. Um, let's move on to, um, we're in the war itself now, and you may wonder why I'm putting up a beautiful portrait uh, from late in later life of a non-warrior, uh, Thomas Jefferson, but uh, you'll see why in a second. Um, he's famous, of course, for all men are created equal, but one of his other really famous phrases, you see it all the time is the, in the titles of books about the American Revolution and so forth, is he described the United States as an empire of liberty. Uh, and, and Jefferson is, is consistently given credit for that phrase because he wrote it in a letter that he wrote uh, in December 25th. 1780 George Rogers Clark, who's going out to battle those same Native Americans I was just talking about. And Jefferson says, you know, get rid of the Indians so we can expand the empire of liberty. I want you just to put that in the back of your head for a second while I talk about uh, uh, Annis Boudinot's Stockton again, because she was one of the signers of a statement. She signed the New Jersey version. I'm showing you the original version here from Philadelphia of an effort on the part of women, uh, the lady shown here uh, is Esther DeBert Reed, whose husband, uh, they didn't call him governor, but he was the top, top political figure in Pennsylvania. And in, I wanna put you in May, 1780, was a real low point of the war for the American side, mostly because of something that happened just down the road from where I am in Charleston, South Carolina, that city was conquered on May 12, 1780 by the British. Uh, and not only the town, but the more than 5,000 American soldiers guarding it were also captured with the city. And the continental currency, you might've heard that expression, not worth a continental. It had gone through massive inflation. If you think the inflation we're experiencing now is painful and some of it like gas prices sure is, but this was, we're talking about eventually the continental dollar it would take a thousand continental dollars to buy one dollar uh, of real money. And so that process had begun by 1780. A lot of bad things were happening to the colonists. And so Esther Reed decided to try to do her part to restore the morale of the Patriots. And that idea that she had was to, uh, for the women of Philadelphia to go around raising money uh, for the troops. Um, and uh, she published the sentiments of an American woman, um, suggest, you know, proposing the idea to women and also defending herself because she knew men were going to criticize that. Women aren't supposed to be going out. You know, there's a reason they refer to prostitutes as, you know, women of the streets. A proper woman isn't supposed to be out going out knocking on doors, uh, go, uh, going from street to street. And so she had to justify it. Part of the way that she justified this idea 
was that she, in this thing that she published in the newspaper, she talked about women leaders of the past, people like Catherine the Great of, of Russia, or you see where she says Elizabeth, that's referring in part to Elizabeth, um, the, the pre, you know, 17th century, 16th and 17th century queen of England. She said these, you know, there have been all these women who've, who've been the monarchs, the queens of various European states. They've done a good job. And what have they done? They've extended the empire of liberty. So that phrase, I, you can now do these electronic searches. No one had used that phrase before um, Esther de Burt Reed did in June of 1780. They, they'd use it as a sort of a synonym for a heaven, but no one had ever used it for anything earthly until she did in June of 1780. She printed this thing up and she sent it to the governor's wives of all the other states, sent one to New Jersey. Um, and then that's when they, they drew up something called sentiments of a New Jersey woman and Anna Spudno Stockton was one of the signers of that. Sent it to the other states, including Virginia. And guess who was the governor's wife of Virginia? Martha Jefferson, who showed a copy of this thing re referring to the empire of liberty to her husband, Thomas Jefferson in June of 1780. And then he, quote unquote, coined the term Empire of Liberty in December of 1780. Now, it's possible that's a coincidence, but it seems pretty clear to me uh, that she put the idea in his head. And I want to say one more thing about Esther Reed, because the idea was we'll raise all this money and then we'll just divide it up among the troops. We'd better give them each about two dollars of real money, uh, which given inflation, that's a significant amount uh, of money in dollars were different than it's a Spanish coin. This will really buy uh, soldiers uh, some nice stuff. And she wrote George Washington saying she's going to do that. Of course, he's commander in chief. He writes back saying, no, you may not. Um, because if you give them $2 cash, they're going to do like every soldier does. They're going to go out and buy liquor and get drunk. And I'm going to have a drunken army that's going to be no good to me. Uh, instead, I want you to buy them shirts. And she kind of had a comeback to Washington in a letter. She says, but that's your job. You're supposed to provide them shirts. I don't want to buy them something they need or that they're already entitled to. I want to buy them something they want. I want them to, to decide for themselves how to spend the money. Um, but Washington wrote her back saying, hey, we really need the shirts and I'm commander in chief and you're not. Uh, and, and her husband said, yeah, the last thing we want to do is make George Washington mad. So she gave in on that point and the women took that money they'd raised, bought the cloth and then did the sewing and, and uh, cutting and sewing to make 2000 shirts for the soldiers. Um, each woman stitching her name into the back of her shirt. And those not only really did prop up the soldiers morale, which was the initial goal, but morale was so bad in the Pennsylvania line when it was stationed uh, not far from Princeton uh, up in, um, in um, uh, 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 when it was, Cam I'm forgetting the name of the, somebody, one of you Jerseyans right in the, the uh, chat, what's the name of the, of the park up there? That, that Plum Plumpton was the town they were, but there's a more familiar name I'm spacing. Anyway, they were stationed in North New Jersey uh, and somebody uh, um, said, hey, why don't we mutiny and all march down uh, to Philadelphia, um, Morristown, sorry, they were at Morristown. And uh, somebody said, why don't we march down to Philadelphia? Um, and they ended this mutiny, Washington and his officers did through lots of things. But one of the things they did was giving all these soldiers shirts. And that was some of the shirts that these Philadelphia um, and New Jersey uh, and other women uh, had made. So th they really ended up having impact. They had to give in on buying shirts rather than giving the soldiers cash. but while waiting to spend that money, they had to, you know, they wanted to put it in the bank to keep it safe and, or, or, or Washington wanted them to keep it safe by putting it in the bank. And Essa Reed's political enemies had started a bank and Washington said, hey, I'd really like you to put the money in this new bank. It'll help prop up the bank and, and, and get the bank started. And she knew the bank was being run by her husband's political enemies. And she said, she did something that few people ever did Esther Reed did, and that was she said no to George Washington. So 
don't know if they kept the money under their mattress, but they didn't put it in the bank that Washington wanted her to. So she lost on the shirts, but she won on the bank. A smaller, but, but I think significant example of women standing up to men uh, in the revolution. Okay, so I've talked about women at the, on the home front, but women also played a role in the war itself. And yes, I'm putting up uh, the photo on the front of my book to promote my book, but I'm also wanting to draw your attention to this American soldier standing on the ground. You see, we've got these two British horsemen and an American soldier standing on the ground there with a pistol waylaying these two British soldiers. This is a true scene that happened just about 50 miles that way from me. Um, these were British couriers in 1780, taking a message um, to a British general. Uh, the British soldier stopped them, took the message and had it sent to Nathaniel Green, who was the American commander in the South. And so you're probably wondering why I'm telling you this story. Let me zoom in on that soldier uh, and see. If, I'm gonna I'm gonna put um, Kim and Debbie on the spot here because they're uh, I only have audio from them. Uh, uh, Debbie, can you can you guess what secret this soldier is harboring? Well, it's not fair for me to guess because I already know the answer. Oh, okay, Kim, did you figure yeah, this out? Yeah. See if somebody wants to put it in the chat. Yeah, if anybody wants to post it in the chat or the Q&A, because I know the answer and I don't want to give it away. This soldier is harboring a secret. Uh, while you're, while you, I'll give you a second to do that, but while I'm mentioning that, um, the, there were numerous examples of women in the Revolutionary War who I would describe as Paula Revere's. I know of three just here in South Carolina, cases where a woman uh, heard that the British were going to attack a certain unit of, uh, of, mil of American militia, and the woman uh, got on her horse and rode out ahead uh, of the troops to, to do that supportive thing. Uh, and so we do have that. We have a few examples of, of, uh, of women who actually took up arms. Uh, you've all, or many of you have heard of the Molly Pitcher story, which is another New Jersey story because it comes from Mon the Battle of Monmouth. And the amazing thing, there's a great book uh, uh, called Fatal Sunday about the Battle of Monmouth. And I kept looking in there for Molly Pitcher. And the amazing thing is there, there, there's no individual Molly Pitcher that exactly fits this, the, the 19th century story. And the reason there's no story, there's no individual story is that there are numerous women just at the Battle of Monmouth who um, their husband got shot. And so they picked up his rifle and took over or they helped out uh, in various ways. So they're, they're certainly uh, small compared to the number of men who fought in the war. Almost half of uh, draft, uh, draft age men participated at least for a couple of days. And sometimes people did only fight for a few days in a militia call out, but so many more men than women, but a significant number of women actually fought uh, in the war. But I also want to talk uh, after we see whether anybody's so checked Woody, in Woody, chat. Woody, yes, we have- women who were with the army without fighting. Go ahead. We have responses here from quite a few people who know that the secret she was harboring is that she was a woman. That's right. And they That's see right. she has a waistline and it looks like a woman. There's a lot of different responses here. So, yep. Is that the secret? That is the secret, in fact. So these two women who both married two brothers, uh, the two Martin brothers, so they call, we referred on the Martin sister. Oh, actually, here's the bigger... Um, view of the picture. We use just a kind of a zoomed in view. This was done in 19th century based on Elizabeth Ellett's amazing uh, Women of the American Revolution book published first volume in uh, first two volumes in 1848. Uh, so you see it's the two sisters uh, waylaying the men. The other one, it's sort of more clear that she's a she, isn't it? Um, but anyway, they waylaid these three men, got their message, sent it on. It's reported in 19th century. We're not positive uh, that it's true. But I liked having that picture on my cover because it the whole point is that, you know, the the what we know about the revolution is the tip of the iceberg. And there's this 90 percent that's maybe much more significant even uh, underneath. And, and obviously women are part of that story. Women like Sarah Osborne, who was sort of rediscovered by a graduate student of mine named Riley Sutherland. You are looking at a photograph of a woman who was at the Battle of Yorktown. Uh, and it actually she joined the army 
with her husband uh, before that. These are the people that are too commonly referred to today as camp followers, but uh, my student Riley has really convinced me to not call them camp followers. A, because it kind of sounds like groupies, you know, following the Grateful Dead around the country. Um, they weren't following, they were with the army playing really essential roles. For instance, even women who, um, uh, who were laundresses, you, know, you kind of think of that as socially near the bottom of the totem pole, but what are you doing when you wash a man's shirt? You are killing the lice in that shirt. Lice are the number one spreaders of typhus and typhers were the number one uh, spreaders. Uh, uh, typhus was the number one killer uh, of soldiers um, after George Washington inoculated the army against smallpox in 1777. So you're looking at a life, lifesaver when you look at Sarah Osborne. Yes, they're feeding the soldiers and there's a famous story of her taking coffee to the soldiers at, uh, uh, at, um, um, at, at, George, at uh, Yorktown and possibly apocryphal story about her having a little exchange with George Washington with him basically saying, you know, you gotta, you gotta take cover, you're gonna get shot. And she said, no one meant for, a, a, for the halter will die by the bullet, meaning uh, I'm, I'm gonna get hanged someday as for, for being a bad girl you know, well-behaved women seldom make history kind of thing. Uh, we don't know if that part was true, but we do know uh, that she was extremely proud of her contribution. Oh, the other reason not to call them camp followers is that no one used that word at the time. It wasn't invented, uh, it was actually invented in India um, uh, in the cl closing years of the Revolutionary War, but was never used here in America about the war. So, um, so I've been persuaded by my student to refer to them as the women of the army and they really were saving the, ar uh, saving the army uh, from disease uh, as well as hunger and, and freeing men up for the front and all that. Um, but then the, the other thing that, that Riley likes to point out is that when Sarah Osborne filed a widow's petition, widow's petition after her husband had died, she petitioned for uh, a pension. Uh, and what you're supposed to do in a widow's pension is describe all the great stuff your, done, your husband did to contribute to the war effort. And she did that. She gave about a half page to that and then two and a half pages to her contributions to the war effort. That is, you know, no one asked women to submit pension applications on their own behalf, but she, and it turns out other students Riley's discovered, used their uh, husband's, used their, their, their widow's pension applications as a cover for telling their own story. And while men were starting to refer to them as camp followers and James Fenimore Cooper kind of makes fun of them in, uh, especially in his novel, The Spy, um, they were competing to be remembered in a more positive light, a process that I think is only now happening in the last couple of decades. Um, well, that's all I wanted to say uh, about women uh, in the war. I could say much more, but I'll save it for Q and A. Um, but uh, we could also talk about well, Annis Budno Stockton and, and Abigail Adams. So Debbie, I'm gonna throw it over to you and ask you, do you wanna hear me say a little bit about these two or should we just wait, uh, see what questions people have first or how do you wanna go? Well, one question, thank you for you know what you shared with us earlier. One question that has come up is, um, why did you want to write a book about Abigail Adams? Oh, uh, well, that, that's, uh, that, I wasn't sure whether to talk about these ladies first or answer questions, but I can do both uh, at once because I'm going to tell you something really boring and I'll try to say it really fast. My previous book was about bond speculators' role in the adoption of the Constitution. That's an issue that's been debated by historians a lot. There are all these um, securities the IOUs that had been paid out to soldiers since they couldn't give them real money. And then this bond market developed a very complicated story just on the economic side uh, as, as, as sovereign uh, debt and government finance, all this very dry stuff. But I got excited about it because it has a political impact because a lot of people think there's a, it's, it's, it's very indirect, but a process that helps persuade people like Washington and Hamilton and Madison that we need the constitution. But as I'm researching that, I could tell how dry it was going to be. No one was going to read my book unless I could find one guy out of all these bond speculators and sort of use him to put a face on all the rest. And then my frustration was 
I could find letters from one guy and then account books, you know, drive financial data from another guy. And there was nobody that I had a whole big picture of among all these men who were engaged in bond speculation. I couldn't find one who was really well documented. And I was about to give up on my idea of having one face to put on all the others for my constitution book until I did find a really well documented bond speculator. And that was, drum roll please, Abigail Adams, because she was separated from her husband, John Adams, almost continuously from 1774 to 1784. And that decade was the saddest of her life because she loved John. They were a great pair who really respected each other. Uh, and so she referred to it as my widowhood. She was actually never a widow because John uh, outlived her by eight years, but it felt like widowhood to her. Saddest decade of her life, but economically, this was the best decade in the life of the Adams family because what it did was put Abigail in charge of the family finances and she managed them much better than John ever had. And the main way that she did so was moving his investments out of land where he was making about a 1% annual return on his investment into these bonds where she was making him a return of up to 24 or 25% because the bonds were trading at a fraction of their face value. You could buy them really cheap, but the interest was figured on the face value. So for instance, if you bought a bond that was trading at 10% of its face value, right? It's a hundred dollar bond, you buy it for $10, but your interest every year is $6. So that's a $6 return every year on a $10 investment. Um, and she got not quite those numbers, but uh, numbers close to that, 25% on a lot of her bonds. John didn't like it. And he would constantly write her letters saying, no, 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 put money in land, put money in land. And she'd go, well, we can do that. You're the husband, it's the 18th century. I have to obey you, uh, but, uh, but we really should be investing it in land instead. So I, I, uh, there's an example of one of her bonds you see right in the middle, uh, pay to Abigail Adams. Um, and uh, this is after she finally cashed. Uh, this is a, a note called a consolidated note. Um, she had some sort of insider information because she knew the interest on these notes was being paid in real money. Um, you see the French expression right under her her uh, her name, 90 livre le tournois. That was a, 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 basically the French equivalent of a pound and it was real money. Not, in, not, not suffering from inflation. And so that's part of how she made all of her killing. But I wanted to spin you all the way forward, to not give you my whole Abigail Adams speech, spin you all the way forward uh, to April of 1785. It looks like six, but it's 85. Uh, when uh, the war's over, John's been in France as an American diplomat. She joins him in France now. And so she put somebody else in charge of the family finances uh, back in America. She's with John. Uh, you can see at the top of the letter, Oteuilla, uh, is, uh, if I'm pronouncing that anywhere close to right, this is where they're living in France. And I want you to look at what John Adams wrote to his new business manager, uh, because he had some money uh, coming to him. And he wrote, um, uh, um, I'm glad you purchased that. Oh, oh the, the part in orange at, at the bottom of the screen. You may draw upon me. It's like writing a check. Uh, draw a bill exchange. You may draw upon me to the amount of 300 pounds when you please, and also to pay for Vesta's place if he will sell it reasonably. That is, this is a farm right next to John Adams's farm. And he really wanted that land because he was right, it was right next to his, you know, and he's trying to build it out. Like when we play risk, you know, you want territories next to each other. He wanted that land. And that's what he said on the front of that letter that while he was over there, in France with his wife, Abigail. But watch, I'm gonna show you a little video clip here if it works. Hold on one second. Um, that's what he said on the front of that letter. But if you fold that letter over to the back of it, oh yeah, there's my video clip. This is the same letter, back page, obviously my Xerox of it. And John writes, shooing what I had written to Madam, that's Abigail Adams, she has made me sick of purchasing Vese's place 
Instead of that, therefore, you may draw upon me for 200 pounds, that is good as exchange as you can obtain, and lay it out in such notes as you judge most for my interest. Notes were bonds in, in these, these government securities that were going through this rapid um, process of going way up and way down. And you could only make money if you were really smart, but she was really smart. Here's my point. He had started that letter saying, do what I want to do, which is buy land. And I imagine him trying to write it really quickly before Abigail caught him, but she did catch him. And so by the time he was finishing the letter, by the time John was finishing the letter, she was finishing the letter telling him, don't waste more money on land, take that 200 pounds and go out and buy bonds uh, instead. And so eventually he just gave up, let her buy the land. And here you see them cashing out, her cashing out some of her bonds uh, in the amount of $3,000. That is, she made that average of 25% annual return every year without touching the principal and then gets her principal uh, the face value or, or just short of the face value rather than the much depreciated value that she'd paid. She really made uh, a killing. Um, well, I want to show you, let's see this screen. Let's see how well this is going to come out. Woody, yeah, we've got a lot of questions popping in here. Okay. Let me say one other thing real quick. See the date of this, this document, Quincy, January 18th, 1816. Uh, she's going to die two years later, but she thinks she's dying then. So she wrote her will. And we could play that same game. We don't have time of what's weird about Abigail Adams's will, but I'm going to answer it for speed's sake. The very fact that she wrote a will because women in that era, if they're married, they're not supposed to write a will because they don't own and control any property. Their husbands control all of their property, all of their, of their land. And then the husband gets all of the wife's re, uh, non land that is personal property uh, that is cash and livestock and all of that. It goes straight to the husband. She's not supposed to write a will, but uh, a great collaboration between John and Abigail Adams that um, uh, even though he'd kind of sneered when she'd said, remember the ladies back in 1776, he'd seen her managing his property so well, they, he went along when she took some of that property, set it aside and in defiance of centuries of common law, declared it hers and then distributed it in her will. I'm gonna stop sharing and take questions. Go ahead, Debbie. Um, thank you, Woody. So uh, just starting with, um, what was the status of women in colonial America? And, and do you believe that they accepted that status? Well, first we always have to uh, distinguish between different kinds of women. Uh, enslaved women, of course, were the most miserable people in America because they were completely uh, um, exposed to sexual assault uh, from their owners, uh, which we just keep, uh, the more historians look into those numbers, the higher uh, they get. Because of course that owner by assaulting one of his slaves is not only obtaining whatever gratification he gets from that violent act, but he's also getting property out of it uh, if she becomes pregnant uh, through that. So African-American women, their status was horrific uh, under, under in the colonial era. And there were slaves in all 13 of the colonies that rebelled, as well as the other 13. Did you know there were 26 British colonies in America, only half of which rebelled, most of the rest being in the Caribbean, but of course, Canada, there were two Floridas, neither of which rebelled. Bermuda, Bahamas, and so forth. Uh, so, so we have to distinguish between white women, enslaved women, native women, their status was pretty good. And now they suffered all the same things that native men did, but um, native women could, even after they were married, own land. Uh, they, if their marriage did not go well, for instance, if their husband tried to beat them, which was pretty much legal, for men in 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 uh, in the white part of America, the the white colonists, that was pretty much legal. It was if it happened in a native society, the woman could just divorce her husband. Uh, she kept the house. She put his stuff out there. She also kept the kids. Um, most there was very there were very few divorces among white colonists. But when there were, the husband actually had first dibs uh, on the kids because he is the patriarch of that family. So now we finally come to those white women, the real important factor is whether or not you're a widow. Uh, almost everybody married. And that often meant going straight from your father's rule 
to your husband's rule. And a woman pretty much disappeared legally into the personality of her husband once she got married. Um, she, she could not own or control land. Uh, she couldn't sue or be sued, or any, any of those things. She's subsumed under her husband while she's married. But once he dies, she actually, a woman actually, uh, as a widow, has the same legal rights, uh, uh, property rights as a man. Now, if she gets into a property dispute with a man, it's going to be decided by a male judge and male jury. She can't vote. She can't go to the legislature. But technically, she has the same property rights as men. And while uh, while we're talking about women's legal rights, we do have to mention, uh, since you're in New Jersey and many people watching presumably are, uh, this amazing exception where women uh, who owned property, so we're talking about widows now because married women couldn't own and control property, uh, but propertyed women did vote from 1776 to 1807 uh, in New Jersey, first in just a few counties, and then they expanded it. Um, and there's still a big debate among historians. They adopted their uh, constitution of New Jersey on July 2nd, 1776, the same day that, that Congress declared independence down in Philadelphia, but also the same day that the British landed on Staten Island, right across Arthur Kill, uh, you know, right across, what is that, the, the I-280 bridge, or whatever that bridge is, uh, 295 bridge uh, over, over to Staten Island. Uh, the British were there, the, the New Jerseyans were in a hurry to get their constitution adopted. Some people think they forgot to disenfranchise women. Other people think the men got a, kind of caught, caught up in the libertarian ideals of the time and deliberately enfranchised women. But for whatever reason they did it, we know why they didn't do it, or why they undid it in 1807 was the patriarchal ideology. So the big thing I want to say in response to the questioner, if you're talking about white colonial women, the status of women was not was bad before the revolution and it was bad after the revolution as well the revolution changed very little about the status of of white women thank you woody um so you mentioned the work of elizabeth ellett do you have any opinion as to the reliability of her story of annis did she conduct any personal interviews of stockton children or grandchildren um well, we know very little about her process. Um, I, I can't resist saying that what we what little we know comes mostly from a master's thesis uh, written at William and Mary uh, by a scholar who went on to get her PhD and then went on after that to marry me. Uh, my wife Gretchen uh, Scholl uh, wrote a wonderful thesis that people could order from William and Mary if they're interested. Or actually, I think it's online through William and Mary uh, about Elizabeth Ellis and. And, uh, Elizabeth Ellett, and she did find out a lot about her, uh, like, like everyone thought she was living in South Carolina when she wrote the book, but uh, my wife showed uh, in her master's thesis many years ago uh, that she was actually um, in New York living separately from her husband, so there's a little bit of intrigue there, but, it, uh, but I don't remember, and I don't see Gretchen around here, and this was 20 years ago, about, uh, about if she if, if Gretchen found anything on her process specifically with Annis Boudinot, but some of her papers do survive. So you might want to look at, at Gretchen Scholl's uh, master's thesis and um, and you know the in the bibliography you could see where a lot of the Ellis Ellet correspondence uh, survives today. I think one of the New York libraries. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so we talked a little bit about what role women played in the Revolutionary War. What did women get out of the war? All right, here's my, con Kim promised controversy and here it comes, not much. If we, and again, we make the distinction between native, uh, the broad distinction, because all these groups are internally diverse between native uh, African-American and, and free white women. Um, native Americans are clearly the people who suffered the most as a result of the revolution. Uh, um, even though they won their part of the war, they, they did pretty well in the West. The big objective of the Continental Army in the West was to capture Detroit, which is where the Native Americans got their arms and ammunition from the British. And they never did conquer. They never got anywhere near the place because the Native Americans kept them away uh, from Detroit. So the, the they did their job. They won the war in the West. They kept the 
frontiers people like Daniel Boone sort of back on their heels, um, but the British sold them out um, and eventually the US conquered them. So I'd say natives and especially native women because they're the most vulnerable to attacking armies. Um, they were the worst losers of the, the worst victims, excuse me, of the Revolutionary War. African Americans, it was sort of a split decision for them because some got free. Uh, you know, various British governors and generals issued emancipation proclamations, kind of like Lincoln's, not exactly, but a lot, a lot like Lincoln's. And something like 9,000 African Americans fought uh, and survived, uh, fought on the, on the uh, American side. Um, not all of them survived. Thousands of them died of disease, as, as happens in war, but happened to them more because they were so tightly concentrated, but settled in Nova Scotia. Uh, and after the war, many of them moving their way, uh, making their way over to Sierra Leone in 1792. Um, and about half of them were women. Um, one of the, the or first of those emancipation proclamations was, ex, was an offer extended to, you have to be owned by a patriot, like Jefferson or Washington and Patrick Henry, all three of whom had slaves escape them after this emancipation proclamation. So you had to be owned by a patriot and you had to be able and willing to bear arms. So that sounds like that's an offer to men, doesn't it? Able and willing to bear arms because it's the 18th century. They didn't think of women as having that capability, but here's the amazing statistic that I talked about in my first book, half of the people who joined Governor Dunmore uh, in response to that Emancipation Proclamation were women and children. So, oh, we didn't talk about free women. Very little changed legally. Divorce got a tiny bit easier in a bunch of places, but that's a double-edged sword for women because it was often a chance for men to dump their wives um, and, and leave them in, in, in a bad situation. But it did, on the positive side, uh, women could could finally, not in all places, my state, South Carolina, we, we didn't reform the divorce laws or allow women to get a divorce without going to the legislature until Reconstruction. We owe that to Black South Carolina women who finally got uh, some some influence, not the vote, uh, uh, during Reconstruction and, and got that from the people running the state during that brief period. So, it, uh, but in several states did make it easier for a woman, that's a big thing, of course, to be able to, to divorce an abusive husband. But in terms of property rights, women's got, women got no improvement in their property rights as a result of the Revolutionary War. That wouldn't come until the middle of the 19th century. Uh, thank you for that. So and there's a question here, uh, any, or actually a statement, anyone interested in widow's rights might enjoy the novel, The Widow's War by Sally Gunning. Someone has posted that. Um, and Another question here. I don't know if you're going to know the answer to this one, Woody, but if you don't, I think Kim might, but we'll see. Uh, is there truth to the tea protest story about Annis's niece, her brother, Elias Boudinot's nine-year-old daughter, Susan? Allegedly, while visiting William Franklin, she was offered tea, which she refused several times. Is it true that eventually Susan accepted the tea and tossed it out an open window? That, that story shows up in all, almost all of the books about women uh, in the revolution. Um, but they've asked a great question and Kim, come on if you can help on this. I, I've never gone to the footnote uh, of that story to see uh, where it came from. I feel like it's a fairly contemporary source, but I, uh, it is certainly true that 19th century families uh, as families have a want to do, uh, improve those stories. So it's possible that got improved, but I appreciate I'm going to take that as a challenge to finally, that's in Mary Beth Norton's book, Liberty's Daughters, I'm 99% sure. And so you're challenging me. I'm going to go check out the footnote and see how close to the, how close to an eyewitness source. I'll bet you that's a um, early to mid 19th century family story. Which, Woody, which that level of the one on the cover of my book. So I better, Kim, better watch Kim's it. Got, yeah. Kim's got uh, something. That, that's one of those stories that is so good. Uh, it's it's it would be really nice if it was true. So I don't want to influence your researches on this, but yeah, maybe that's why I've never checked it out. Maybe it's not just my laziness, but I don't want to know. <laughs> um, so we have a couple more questions here. I've read that John Adams wrote a letter to Abigail telling her that the principles of the Declaration applied to everyone, women as well as men. Is that true? Uh, that is a very generous reading of a letter that John wrote Abigail on, 
um, in, in April of 1776 in response to her famous Remember the Ladies letter of March 31st, 1776. First thing I should say that he said uh, is, um, I cannot but laugh um, uh, at, at, at her claim. So uh, as Co the late Koki Roberts said, she wrote a wonderful book about women in the revolution and not, she and I were on a panel together. And her response to that was, I would have killed him. Um, I cannot but laugh. And you can just see John Adams as played by Paul Giamatti in the wonderful uh, HBO movie, uh, making that arrogant, pompous comment. Um, but he did say uh, something, what he said to Abigail and then more clearly to his friend, uh, James Warren was, we got to hold the line on women because uh, if we allow women to vote, then we're going to have to allow propertyless men to vote. And actually of the groups I'm talking about, that was the first group to get the right to vote in some states, at least starting with Pennsylvania, um, was, was propertyless men. You know, in the colonial era, every state required that you own a certain amount of property before you could vote. So at most half of the men could vote. Uh, but anyway, uh, he said, if we let women vote, then women are going to ask for the right to vote. Children are going to ask for the right, the right to vote. Slaves are going to ask for the right uh, to vote. So he saw it as, you know, this is the thumb in the dike where we, the, the dam is going to burst unless we hold the line here uh, on women. But he was sort of thinking hypothetically that, you know, that would require, but, but, but where do you draw the line? What's so magical about 21, which is the voting age uh, at that time? Why not 20? And if not, if 20 is okay, why not 18? But he wasn't, I, I think that the reading that your uh, questioner has picked up where he's saying, rah, rah, uh, let's be consistent here. That's not coming from John. That's coming from Abigail because in the Remember the Ladies letter, um, which, uh, which by the way, anybody can read online, Every letter that Abigail and John wrote each other is online. Uh, just uh, Google Adam's family correspondence, Adam's family correspondence, and you can read all 2,000 of letters they wrote each other. You can either read the handwritten version, you saw how wild 18th century handwritten writing was just now, or the hypertext version, so you can search it. And if you're interested in midwives, see what they said about midwives, et cetera. But anyway, uh, she, in the Remember the Ladies letter, she twice quoted John to John because she loved her husband, but she also knew he was kind of full of himself. So nothing, no better way to his heart than to flatter him by quoting him. But she also did it with a purpose because she said, hey, didn't you say no taxation without representation? And aren't women who own property who have to pay taxes, aren't they uh, taxed? And didn't you say something to the effect of all men would be tyrants if they could. That's something that people like Jefferson, like Jefferson and Adams and George Washington had said against Parliament and King George III and Lord North and all those people in Britain, tyranny is this constant danger and we're battling tyranny. That's why we're declaring independence. Um, but she quotes this back to Adams. He'd meant men as in anybody will be a tyrant if they can, we got to restrain tyrants. And she said, she quotes it back to him, meaning men as in male would be tyrants if, if they could. Uh, so, so the lines, my point is, it's really Abigail, not John, who says, and by the way, they're both writing before the Declaration of Independence was even adopted, but she's the one who's saying the libertarian of ideals, ideals, if they make sense for men battling Britain, then they make sense for women battling men. And if that goes, I'll answer more briefly the second part of that question, which is, I'm always astonished, and and I want I want to promote this book if I can find. Oh, where's my copy of it? Um, there's a book called Only for the Eyes of a Friend. Oh, here it is. Um, I have a library copy. Uh, I recommend other people getting as well. Although you can buy it. Um, uh, let me take you to the. the you can buy it online at morvin.org. You can buy it online from you guys. Yeah, you can buy it online from Morvin. Very yeah. cool. Very cool. Um, hang on. Let me turn to it. Or come to uh, our museum shop in Princeton. Only for the eyes of a friend. They kind of get light on it. So one thing I was reading in there, this is actually not from Manus Budno Stockton herself, but from her friend, Esther Burr, wrote something way back in 1757. And I got to switch to my other screen to quote it directly. Um, uh, I'll be there in two shakes. Um, um, 
burr, burr, burr. Oh, here we go. All right, this is 1757. She's um, sort of flirting slash sparring with this tutor at Princeton. Um, and uh, she, the guy says, women were not cool and rational enough to ever truly love anybody. So this sounds to me like a Princeton tutor who couldn't get a date. Uh, and so he says, oh, it's the women's fault. They're not cool and rational enough to love me. That's how I read it. Her retort to that was that if a woman has even just a little education, then Ben say that makes her pr uh, proud to such a degree that she was disgustful. Oh, no, this is the guy speaking. He also says that we, we can't give women education because it makes them too proud. Here he is proud and boastful himself. He says, if you give women education, this is what's going to happen. It makes her, quote, proud to such a degree that she was disgustful to all her acquaintance. My point is that Esther Burr in 1757 is criticizing him uh, for saying that. Um, and so there's a kind of an underground proto-feminism out there long before the revolution. I do think it gets amped up by the revolution. Um, for instance, uh, 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 um, Annis, in a letter in 1789 to her brother Elias Boudinot, uh, said she worried about she worried about being quote being sneered at by those who cre uh, criticize female productions. That is, um, uh, men who didn't think women could write good poetry. Um, and she wrote a, she wrote a, one of her poems was uh, let's see, I can find this real quick. It was an epistle upon some gentlemen refusing to admit ladies to their circle into their parlor till supper where they met for conversation and business once a week, lest the ladies should hinder by their chit chat the purpose of their meeting. Um, so she was very aware of men. She didn't say it was all men, but she certainly implied there were a lot of them, of men who looked down on women and she really uh, resented that. So maybe rather than uh, calling uh, somebody like Annis Boudinot Stockton, uh, even a proto-feminist, what I would call them, what, what is clear that they were is that they were anti-misogynists. They were aware that a lot of men uh, were misogynists and they were challenging men on that before the revolution and even more so during and, and after the revolution. Thank you, Woody. You're going to have to come visit Morven because you're going to see a quote right in one of the galleries distinctly about um, how Annis felt about the men excluding the women when they wanted to talk because they, but really we knew that the women would have more to say than the men even. Um, yeah, so, yeah, and the fact that they knew that, you know, they weren't, I think a lot of people think oh, women in the old days were brainwashed, they were subservient, you know, handmaiden's tale and all that, but they were, they, they, they were on to it. They were on to it. Another question here, how were women treated during the triangle, triangular trade? I think they meant triangle trade. Uh, yeah, I, I, they're talking about, I think the person, so we know that 12 and a half million uh, women set out on the, uh, I'm sorry, 12 and a half men and women set out on the, on the, on the, the voyage from Africa and, um, and actually millions had died on the way to the coast over the course of those four centuries. Um, and, and another million died on the way over um, but as, as I said about on them, uh, once they were working here, what we used to call plantations, and I'm being persuaded to call them slave labor camps because that's what they were, um, as there, women were, uh, were susceptible to being sexually assaulted on the slave ships, and there are numerous reports of that. Um, in some ways, they could, uh, women and children, because of the, the, the ship owner's prejudices, they were allowed to be on deck uh, on many occasions, uh, at least once the, the ship had left port. So while it was out on the open ocean, they would definitely let kids and often let women up on deck where it was so much healthier because they were less afraid of women rebelling um, than men. So it's obviously healthier to be up there, but again, you're, you're subjected to sexual assault. And I don't know of any cases of men being sexually assaulted uh, and 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 way too many uh, of women. Now I should mention because the people running these slave ships thought that women were safer to leave on deck, they were less likely to lead a revolt. Sure enough, it is often women 
who did lead slave revolts because they had the run of the deck and they could organize things. Um, so our that's so great here. So our last question, I'm not sure. I want to see what your answer is going to be for this because um, we'll see. We'll see if you've got this one. Um, uh, I understand that Richard Stockton, the signer, was imprisoned by the British and that his health never recovered. Did Annis outlive him and what was her life like afterwards? The Stocktons were ancestors of mine and I would be interested in learning more about her. Now, before you answer, just so you know, I mean, I know you haven't been to Morvin, but I'm just gonna say to this person who's an anonymous attendee, visit Morvin because <laughs> you're an ancestor, but I would love to hear your take on this, Woody, um, that, you know, what do you think? What do you My take is to throw that one right back to you. I mean, we know that she was a widow for a, a long time. Um, and 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 I would say she 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 of course she was terribly sad, but she thrived as a widow. You see a real uptake uh, in her poetry writing. Am I right, Debbie? She died in 1780. Uh, he died in 1781. Um, yeah, she she outlived him. She was a young widow. Um, she outlived him, and and actually, you're right. She thrived. She her correspondence with George Washington, you know, was long after he, her husband had passed. And so, um, yeah. And, and her and before her husband passed as well, but I think it intensifies after. Right, intensified afterwards, right. And she really becomes much more political. I was struck reading the poems in, in, in this book about how political, now, in a sense, everyone became political in the 1780s and especially the 1790s. And, you know, the French Revolution was kind of fought out in America as half the people took the French side and half the took the side. Uh, half the people in America took this out of everyone else in Europe, especially the British who were trying to put down uh, the French Revolution. But I was struck here. Let me read you because it, it goes to the uh, women's issue we were talking about before. One poem that she wrote, uh, she's talking about how much she hates the French Revolution. And she says, if men ever quit the post, Columbia's daughters like the Grecian dames would grasp the helmet and enroll their names. And then they would soon put down your soon put your song collat to flight. You know the song collat, song collat were the radicals um, uh, in the French Revolution, uh, and um, and she was really furious because she'd seen a print of of one of the radicals from the French Revolution imagining George Washington being guillotined, and of course nothing could make her uh, madder than that. She wrote in that one, whether contempt or pity, most I feel tis not in words or numbers to reveal. So she was a, a extreme opponent of the French Revolution and generally a Federalist. Um, a little bit on the elitist side, the same way Alexander Hamilton was. People forget uh, now that Lin-Manuel Miranda has, in my opinion, sort of over-humanized Hamilton. They forget what an absolute elitist he was. And he wanted to... Um, to put uh, once we elect the president and the Senate to have them serve for life. So basically to have a house of Lords and a monarchy here in America. Uh, and she tilted that way. Uh, she was quite the Federalist. And I'm sorry to say as someone who studies indigenous people that here's how she celebrated Washington's birthday in 1790, February, 1790, um, praising him for being an Indian fighter, uh, the savage herds and notice she's going to use she's going to use the word herd like a herd of cattle to refer to Native Americans, uh, you know, just races to refer to any human being to compare them to animals. But she says, understandably, because they've just been in this war, there was ongoing war with Native Americans as as the U.S. tried to make good on its treaty with the Brits that claimed they the U.S. went all the way up to the Mississippi. Anyway, she wrote when savage herds invade our fertile plains and undistinguished scalp the peaceful swains, swain meaning people. So, so this, is, this is what they call a, a, um, um, fake news if, the, if you have the Indians uh, invading uh, the United States when of course it was the other way around. So she was a person of her time, but I think uh, you and I could make the case, Debbie, that she probably became more political uh, after she became a widow. And isn't she an example, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but but the historians have made it very clear that uh, women, if they could possibly afford to, once they'd had one husband and once he died on her, 
um, uh, they did not remarry. Now, very few women had the gumption to never marry, something like 5% remained unmarried. It's just, it's, it's bad form. It's, it's, it's uncool and people worry about you uh, in, in, in all kinds of ways if you never marry. But literally, as Laura Ulrich once put it, a, a great historian now living in Philadelphia, you could marry a guy on Tuesday and he could die Tuesday night. And then on Wednesday morning, you're a respectable widow. Um, well, yeah. Annis, Annis actually had suitors. She, she lived 20 years after um, Richard died. She lived uh, until 1801. So she had suitors, one of them, including um, Witherspoon. Um, oh, yeah. So the Reverend Witherspoon. Yeah. And, and she didn't, she didn't choose to marry again. So um, she it's not because she didn't want affection. It's not because she's anti-male or anything like that. It's because all of her property, her personal property becomes his. And so Debbie, you're a widow. I'm a widow. I marry you. You own a thousand herd of cattle. Guess what? They're all mine. I can give them <laughs> to my girlfriend if I want to, um, <laughs> uh, uh, because because that's personal property. It all goes to the husband. And you own that beautiful house behind you. Now, real estate, you actually, women kept ownership of their real estate, but they couldn't sell it. They couldn't get the profits from it. They couldn't control how it was used and they couldn't deed it. It would be divided among their kids when they died. So there was a big economic reason not to uh, remarry, not only for your own protection, but for the protection of your kids. Because, you know, what's uh, now we've got cool people like uh, like um, Pocahontas, but the, the original set of, of Disney princesses, what do they all have in common? The evil stepmother. That was a real concern. And the evil stepfather is a real concern too. So if you've got that beautiful Morvan behind you and you own it, and then some man comes in uh, and he's got his own kids from his first marriage, he's going to steer that inheritance away from your kids to his kids and there's not much you can do about it. And that's the reason to not remarry. Yeah, Annis and Richard had um, what appeared to be a, a really loving marriage and he um, you know, gave her life tenancy and um, which was unusual then in his will. So um, yeah, I think we've, we've hit all the high notes here. Wait, wait, it looks like there's one more um, question. Ah, here, final question. This is it, because I know we've taken up all your time. Did Anna Stockton ever visit in Philadelphia when it was the capital? Hmm. I feel certain the answer to that question is yes, um, because she was so engaged in politics and she was so close. But uh, um, Debbie or Kim would have to answer that one about her. Um, I don't know if I could say that she, I would, I would guess she probably did. I don't, I can't cite anything that would say when she did or where, but I would guess she must have. Kim, any thoughts? I don't know that it's documented. Uh, I've, I've read the same uh, material that uh, Woody was just talking about, and I, I, I would think that she would have visited, but I, I don't know a particular time she did. You're right, because um, her daughter, somebody just posted her daughter, Julia, lived there, Do Dr. Rush. I mean, I oh, would that's think right. that, that would have been, yeah. you know, she'd go, why she'd wouldn't go help she have, pregnancy, things like that. Right. And Marcus Marsh, who was enslaved at Morven, was very close to her, also lived with Dr. Rush. So chances are there was travel back and forth. Good I mean, quite alert listener, though. Thank you very much to whoever put that in there. Thank you. So um, any final remarks, Woody, because this has been so much fun. Um, it has I been fun. So much. Uh, and we want to encourage everyone to buy <laughs> Liberty is Sweet because they can have fun all the time reading that book. Um, and also... For the eye of a friend because um that's another hot one um and oh someone just posted can't wait to read your book so well, you um there you go well thank you everyone um we will have a recording for those who were with us and there's a lot of thank yous coming in here so thank you again woody it's awesome. been an absolute pleasure we hope you do come to visit Morvin soon i definitely will i, I definitely want to see it and i really appreciate um you're the first person who said, thank you. Every time I answered a question, I love that. I'm going to start <laughs> doing that with my guests too. I think that's a cool little courtesy. And I've enjoyed a lot, a lot of interesting questions from everybody, which I'm grateful for. So, so this was fun for me. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. We see you again. All right. Kim.